Planets are the core players in astrology, so without really understanding the planets first, you can't adequately dive into the signs, the houses, or even begin to read a chart. If you are excited to dive into an examination of what the planets mean and the archetypes and reasons behind that, make sure that you like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you are always up to date with what the stars have in store for you. Hi, I'm Marin. I am a professional astrologer, philosophy student, and witch. I combine traditional Hellenistic astrology techniques with modern psychological counseling dynamics in order to provide grounded spiritual guidance. So along with this video, I'm going to provide some recommendations for further ancient source readings below because you can find a hell of a lot of modern takes on the planets, but if you really want to go back to the roots of what I'm saying and hash that out for yourself, um, there's ancient sources and translations that I recommend more that I'm going to link below. So planets in ancient times were known as the wandering stars, communicating their intentions towards earthly events. This was a metaphor, this was not, you know, literal, but they were thought as being the intermediary between the pure divinity of the fixed stars, which did not move as much, and the lower divinity of the human soul. They were the messenger. Or or the meteor, the, the medium between the two. And these multifaceted alignments of the planets were messages to be communicated as omens for humans to predict what was going to happen to them. And there were seven traditional planets, and I know the sun and the moon aren't planets, but it's easier to say seven traditional planets than five traditional planets and two, you know, lighting things. Um, so the sun, known as Helios, the moon, known as Selene, Mercury, Hermes, also known as the twinkling one, Venus, Aphrodite, the sparkling one, Mars, Aries, the fiery one, Jupiter, Zeus, the radiant one, and Saturn, Kronos, the shiny one. Those are our seven there. And the reason that I'm not using Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto in this video is because the seven traditional planets are visible to the naked eye and therefore have a wholly more foundational and different application than the outer planets. If you would like a full video on the outer planets, let me know in a comment below. Uh, let me know if you want a video on that because because they are more like energetic qualifiers, you can get to whatever you need to get through through the seven traditional planets alone when you're talking about predictive astrology. And um, the outer planets are cool, but I cannot stress enough that there's a fundamental difference, and that's why I'm not going to include them in this video. And because the seven traditional planets rule certain signs and are exalted in certain signs, they are more foundational to the creation of astrology as a system because of the way that the divination form took place in being formed. Because before the creation of satellites or telescopes, the omens were what we could see. There's a difference. And even with what they were able to see, the way that they phrased planets were a little interesting. They used to call planets, for example, they would call Mars the star of Aries or um, Venus the star of Aphrodite. There was, a, there was a bit of a difference because they didn't know the difference between the wandering stars of the planets because they saw them moving and didn't know that they weren't stars, and then the fixed stars that they saw just as stars because they didn't know the difference between planets and stars. And you can never know too much about the planets. If you ever feel like I need to upgrade my astrology and study more, go back to the planets. Read some more ancient shit on them. The early origins of these planets were named after Babylonian gods, um, and around the 6th century BCE, they turned into some Greek names and then Roman names. For example, the goddess of love in Babylon, uh, Ishtar, turned into Aphrodite, which then with the Romans became Venus. So to this day, when we're talking about the planets, we're invoking these divine archetypes. We don't have to think of them as literal gods, I don't, but it's the kind of homage to the practice that we're going through to still uphold those names and call upon the archetype of that divine. And a lot of their meanings came from millennia of correlation and data compilation. There are thousands of years of data piled up that would correlate a certain divine archetype that is simply pure to the collective consciousness with the certain planetary body. So they would notice that, for example, when Mars was in a certain conversation with Saturn that the crops didn't grow while when Jupiter and Venus were in a certain conversation the rain would be plentiful and these things over millennia were compiled so the ancients weren't some you know barbaric idiots they were also in their own way compiling a lot of a lot of diligence from the second century onward this divine idea became less relevant as Christianity basically uh, posed a big fucking issue to astrology because with the enlightenment and the idea that reason and reason being the only most upholding form of using the mind or even the mind itself as being this this holier-than-thou concept 
they wanted astrology to be as reason oriented as possible so they disconnected a lot of the magical traditions from it which aren't inherent to astrology but naturally tend to develop from it even though the underground hermetic mystery schools did survive um like underground especially in other parts of the world and today's modern archetypal school of astrology popularized by richard tarnas and becca tarnas and kind of in the school of carl jung plays into the same idea of the divine archetypes but in a more collective psyche oriented way of thinking that i really do resonate with myself and this revival of astrology that is taking place since about the 80s 90s hasn't just been around the ancient forms of astrology from like the early early bces it also has to deal with what was lost, you know, during the more uh, Middle Ages and what was lost during the times when reason overpowered the magical tradition. And the last clarifying point before we get into the meanings, myths about the planets can add clarification, but they do not justify the meanings because the myths are man-made stories about the planets. They are not planetary in and of themselves. So myths can be helpful and they can add our imagination to get a flair for what the planets are really talking about. But for example, like the outer planets are really poorly correlated to their mythical counterpoint. Neptune is much more terroristic and um, honestly like sexually perverse than Neptune, which is formless and blobby. And Uranus's myth um, has to do with getting his genitals cut off, and that, that, that's not that's not an indicator that we ascribe to Uranus. So um, the inner planet myths do tend to actually coincide pretty well because the formation of the myths often happened alongside the naming of the planet. But um, don't analogize myth to planetary meaning. See myth as a human-oriented comment on the planetary meaning that you can decide for yourself whether it makes sense or not. Because each planet is a transcendental archetype. Archetype is the thingiest thing. It is the reddest red. It is the, when you think of a dog, what is the perfect dog? I mean, it, there isn't such thing on earth, but do you think of a golden retriever about the size of a lab? Like the most utmost exist of X is what an archetype is. And that's why there is no perfect manifestation of a planet in reality. There is simply the form, the, the, the platonic form that we're calling upon when we evoke a planet. And also if you want a full video on like the philosophy and hermetic systems that lead us to even be able to conceptualize the planets, that is my, that is my shit. And I quite literally like have a degree and I'm studying that for the rest of my life kind of. So um, if you want to get into the philosophy and the hermetic shit behind this, let me know in a comment below. So with the planetary meanings now, there's a system of basic contrasting natures that I really heavily draw upon. And it was first mentioned in an ancient writer, Rhetorius, and I really love Chris Brennan's translation of it that I've kept for years and years ever since taking his course. I have this like on a note because I love calling upon it that there are contrasting natures between the planets to describe the spectrum of the human experience. The sun emits while Saturn rejects. The moon receives while Saturn excludes. Mercury argues, Jupiter affirms. And this one I believe I tweaked a bit. Venus unifies and Mars separates. So when we get into these planets, we'll see how they manifest. So starting out with the luminaries. The concept of light, visibility, and transmission of light was really indica like indicative of the foundations of astrology. So the two planets that provide light are essential to the chart. Starting with the sun, it is the archetype of the celestial god, and it's necessary to see anything. It's the center of the solar system. It lights up the world. And this idea of sight as understanding informs a lot about astrology. Its home is Leo, it's exalted in Aries, it's fallen in Libra, and it is exiled in Aquarius. So it leads the daytime team of planets. The sect, the team of planets, is led by the sun, and its orbit is always steady. It's this consistent upholding force. It has a yang nature to build, and it has a hot and dry temperament. It's not excessive like Mars, but it's this luminosity of lighting up and informing. It represents our egoic creativity, so if you're thinking of it as a self-based indicator, which it can be, it deals with the story arc that is motivating us to self-actualize. The ascendant is much more our character, our body, and our identity, but the sun can be who we aspire to be, what we are famous for, what our um, 
what our honor, honors are in life, in life or our career-based fame, it more often than not will represent the father, authority figures, or masculine people of prominence in your life. I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen a really, really difficult or really positive sun transit and that deals with the father or with you directly receiving honors. It is not so much your, it's not you, um, it's more what you're rising up to illuminate what your life is revolving around and often that is a goal and often Often that is, you know, what your father, the, the image that he has led in your life or masculine authority figures. Because I know in my chart, for example, moon mother, son, father doesn't really work that clearly because that's not the upbringing that I had. But in general, that's what I'm going to, you know, you can you can extrapolate for yourself. Moving on to the moon as an archetype. The moon was known as the celestial goddess. The moon reflects the sun's light, so it does not provide, but it is the queen. It is also this counterfeit, non-rigid, always responding type of energy because it's of the utmost impermanence. It's only in a sign for two and a half days. It is this constant faucet or background noise of the chart, and that can either be beautiful background noise of like elevator music or a symphony, or that can be fucking like shit shitty screaking background noise if we have a shitty placed moon. Sorry, I, 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 I'm, okay, we're gonna continue. Um, it reflects bodies, cycles, moods, that which is changing and evolutionizing, but in a rhythm. In the body, it can deal with, for example, like female menstruations, the moon. It can deal with how we deal with self-care. The sign and placement of the moon and the house placement deal with what brings us back to equilibrium. It is the coming into being and the passing away of things, the manifestations both in coming and in leaving. It is at home and rules Cancer, it is exalted in Taurus, it is fallen in Scorpio, and it is exiled in Capricorn. So with it being in fallen Scorpio as well, because it is fallen or sunken and depressed in Scorpio because it's a volatile sign and the moon does not want volatility, it wants the steadiness of Taurus, no planet can then be exalted in Scorpio because it's the depression of the moon, the background noise, nothing can be exalted there. And that's like straight Hellenistic doctrine. And it leads the nighttime sect. So it leads the nighttime team of planets while the sun leads the daytime team of planets. It is of yin nature to nourish. It is a moist and cool temperament, the perfect conditions for germination or for, you know, growing a baby, a womb. So as I mentioned, it represents bodily cycles, the internal emotional world, if you want to see it as that, but also maternal figures and the mother, the nurturer. And for example, in my chart, um, that was really my father growing up and I have a like laughably well-placed moon. It makes no difficult aspects. It's in the 10th house. It's angular. It's really beautifully placed. And like, I have the dopest, most filling both parental roles dad ever. It's just incredible. And so I can see that as filling the maternal role. It can also deal with the act of day-to-day -day travel. Like I said, cycles, rhythms, what we do on a daily basis to get by. So moving on to Mercury. Mercury as an archetype is the bestower of intelligence. It is intelligence more so than wisdom. Wisdom's more Jupiter, but it's also the gleaming, glistening, glittering one. And with that idea of glistening, I think of the brilliance of sprinkles on water, of, or uh, sparkling on water. Not brilliance only in terms of like you were a brilliant person, but brilliance in terms of the sparkling of something. The brilliance of the mind. And Mercury makes statements and it declares. Overall, it fills this role of being a vacillating messenger, so it switches sides a lot. It can either be on the daytime or the night team, depending on your chart. It is its own like devil's advocate, its own contrariety, and it's not inherently benefic or malefic. It is not diurnal or nocturnal, it depends on the chart, and it is not necessarily masculine or feminine. It'll depend on the chart. It's not inherently yin-yang. It is very much a they-them androgynous uh, ambidextrous figure in the chart. It is also the fastest planetary orbit. It gets into these little spaces in the ecliptic in, the un in our solar system that no other planet gets to, and it's the only planetary mythological figure that can go both um, in the world and in the underworld. It's the messenger. It rules Gemini and Virgo. It's Yang and it's Yin home. It is exalted in Virgo. It is fallen in Pisces and it is exiled in Sagittarius. And it is the fastest orbit of the planets, so it can't ever be more than about one sign ahead or behind the sun. It's the little tag along messenger guy. It is variable in temperament, so for some, like Mercury in the way that you think varies a lot from person to person. So, like I said, it can represent mode of logic, the way that you think, your intellectual 
faculties studying, debating, external things like distractions or the way that you intellectualize the world, writing, speech, communication, conveyance, delivery back and forth with other people. Um, and it can also deal in the chart if you have like prominent mercury of things like banking or mercantilism or commerce and this switching idea. Venus as an archetype is the fertile life force. She passively attracts, so it has to do with that which is appealing and attractive. The gentle unification is how it's the lesser benefic. It is not the big daddy Jupiter benefic, but it gently unifies. It's, it's cute. Cute is Venus. It rules Taurus and Libra. It's yin and yang homes. It is exalted in Pisces. It is fallen in Virgo, and it is exiled in Aries and Scorpio. So it is of the nighttime sect, the nighttime team led by the moon, and it has this yin nature to magnetize. It brings things together magnetically. It does not, you know, cancerously grow like Jupiter might. And because it's the smaller one out of Venus and Jupiter, it's the lesser benefic or the smaller good planet. And it is moist and hot. It is cute. It's cute. Um, I don't like the word moist, but that's traditionally what's used. And so we're going to use it here and be mature about it. Maybe. It represents value systems. So that which is valuable and it can actually represent war in terms of how you get what you want, how you do things that deal with picking a side. It is attraction, reception, appeal, and it can deal with women or feminine figures, um, any type of femininity in life or in transit. It can really indicate that. Aesthetics, beauty, art, physical pleasure. I mean, Venus is well understood, I feel like, in today's, in today's aesthetic culture. Relationships, marriages, and friendships can also be represented by Venus, things that unify and bring people together. And in a more mundane context, it can represent ceremonies, theaters, rituals, and art. Mars as an archetype is the destroyer of life force. It is the combative warrior. It's an eliminatory agent, so it severs things and it cuts away, it strikes away. It rules and is at home in Aries and Scorpio. It is exalted in Capricorn, fallen in Cancer, and exiled in Taurus and Libra. So it's the nighttime sect member. It is the malefic, the say no bad guy of the nighttime team ruled by the moon. And it has this young nature to energize. There's some inconsistencies in the tradition around like Mars as young or yet, but I see it as young, even though it is this um, often nighttimely thought planet. It is the lesser malefic. So it's smaller than Saturn and you can also step upon it. That is a difference between Mars and Saturn is that you can step on Mars and Venus and and the, those are the lesser benefic and malefic, and you cannot step on Saturn or Jupiter, the greater planets. It is dry and excessively hot. It is overwhelmingly intemperate warmth, not even warmth, like burning. It is violent, and extreme heat is necessary for some things, for transmutation, for working with like metallurgy or elements, if you're working with chemicals. You know, Mars can come in handy, but a knife can both be a scalpel to save someone's life and it can be a knife to kill someone and stabbing them. So the Mars can be both like the courageous warrior that does their duty and the nagging, um, like violent, you know, degenerate type of energy. It is draw er, it represents assertivity, aggression, and exertion. The way that you are examining and therefore acting upon the world. It can represent siblings, men, and competitors in the chart. And as an action, it's around severing, separating, burning, violating. It represents strife, discord, violence, war, robbery. And I'm taking these a lot of them straight from Vadius Valens, the source that I'll leave below because I love his planetary. Uh, um, planetary commentaries and I've turned them into like more modern associations. Lying, misleading, dishonesty. Athletes, surgeons, soldiers, metal workers, people who are physically operatory. Ulcers, fevers, inflammation with health. Mars is often a troublesome indicator. It's also important to note that when a planet is retrograde, it takes on Martian troublesome significations. So it's not like a planet that is retrograde becomes Mars, but you can think of Mars as troublemaker energy as being applied to planets that are retrograde.
So Jupiter as an archetype is the expansive life force. There is this huge gas giant quality to Jupiter. It is the magnificent king, Zeus, the Pope. It is abundant inflation, which can be cancerous or it can be life providing. Its domicile, its homes are Sagittarius and Pisces. It is exalted in Cancer. It is fallen in Capricorn and it is exiled in Gemini and Virgo. It is of the daytime sect and it is the greater benefic. It is on the sun's daytime team and it is like big daddy gas giant. That's what that's what Jupiter is. It has a young nature to affirm. So it actively affirms things and what I like to draw upon for Jupiter is that Oprah meme where it's like you get a car, you get a car, you that is Jupiter, that is like give me everything and I will just keep giving. It is hot and moist. It is, I mean it's a gas giant. Like it's great conditions for growth and Growth is great, it can be cancerous if it's unchecked, but in general we do want to grow, we do want to be big and strong, and it's if that gets out of control in the improper mannerisms that it can be problematic. So it represents growth, prosperity, expansive, uh, expansiveness, and it can also not only represent like just obvious growth, but things growing together or adhering and cohering so that they make sense, because you have to have healthy connection of parts in order to make in a, a, um, a greater party enhanced and growing. It can also really definitively represent teachers, gurus, or leaders in your chart. If you have a prominent Jupiter, you'll likely uh, come across teachers and superiors in your life that help you out in that way. And while Mercury represents more data collection and facts and just intelligence, Jupiter is lived wisdom. And there's a word that shows up a lot for this, which is gnosis, which is like spiritual mystery knowledge or more lived wisdom. It's um, the experience of information that leads you directly to the divine through a journey, not just the straight facts. It's kind of like how in a lot of ancient Greek philosophy, they talk about how true wisdom is understanding of principles and a system not memorizing facts. That system is Jupiter. And it can also represent alliances, trusting groups, freedom, setting, setting prisoners free. Um, and it also says yes to things big time. Finally, we get to Saturn, which represents the boundaries of the life force. I mean, look at it. It is the giant ringed planet of the literal boundary of where we can see in the universe. That that is past Saturn, we cannot really see. It's the idea of the elder hermit. It is, he's grumpy, he is skinny, he is stoic, and he is whiny, but he is always there following through. It is constricting negation, which is not inherently bad, however it is malefic and it is sober. Sober's a big Saturn world word. Its domiciles, its homes are Capricorn and Aquarius, it is exalted in Libra, fallen in Aries, and it is exiled in Leo and Cancer. It has a yin nature, but it's a yin nature to endure. So even though Saturn is of the daytime sect and it is the malefic and it is of um, feminine orientation generally, there's some dispute, but I tend to ascribe it as a feminine force. It's because it's enduring, it's passive, but it's not like a fun receptive mode like Venus is in its passivity. And it's the greater malefic. It is like big daddy constriction and boundaries. It, I mean, it rains diamonds, which is beautiful because it's a lot of dedication that gets there and a lot of constriction, but that's fucking scary, like raining diamonds. I die in a minute with my like tiny ass. It is, it's dry and it's excessively cold. Uh, the conditions for death. It represents lessons, punishments, challenges, sobriety, and you can tell I'm a child of Saturn based upon the lighthearted attitude I have of like, those things sound great. It represents sorrow, misery, slander, depression, isolation, like psychological turmoil and deterioration, the loss of your mental faculties, all that fun stuff. Um, elders, ancients, orphans, widows, those people that have gone through something and are therefore hardened or of wisdom. Like Jupiter is like great guru, really abundant, optimistic. Saturn is like the zen master that doesn't take shit and doesn't, you know, overly do it, but is super wise. It can, it's authoritative confirmation or denial. Saturn is very definite and very limited, and it can le represent limits, walls, blocks, deaths, tombs, coffins, morgues, places where we go to die, but it can also represent things that are larger epochs of time. So things like authority or administrations and 
dynasties, things that are very long-lasting. Saturn says no to things, but it says no to things breaking down as well, and if you're dedicated and you have a lot of Saturn in you, that's great eminence. That is like, you did it. Saturn gives back what you put in, and Saturnian wisdom, so like if Mercury is facts or just intelligence, just intelligence, I mean it's important, uh, but it's a uh, smaller scale, and Jupiter is wisdom or underlying principles, Saturn is the wisdom that you get from meditating alone for 20 years or from being in prison and like the hard insight of grief and solitude that is beautiful and it's not a joyful study but it is the path. And I'll actually touch on just a moment like what the outer planets then might be if you see them with these planets. Like just for a quick note, the outer, I'm not going to go in deep to them so if you want a full video you can let me know, but Uranus is a good indicator of spontaneity, of innovation, of unconventionality of events. Neptune is a good indicator of glamour, of illusion, of dreams and delusion, and of spiritual connection. And Pluto can be intensity, psychological turmoil, or regenerative processes. So if any of these are close or aspecting any of the other, the main planets that will inform that planet. So if you enjoyed this and you want to look at your chart and where the planets are in your chart, you can let me know by heading to the link down below and I would love to read for you. Everything is in the link in bio. And also if you are a spiritual practitioner yourself, someone who is looking for any type of spiritual service, check out Rashi. It's my platform down below which is connecting spiritual practitioners with their ideal clients like in a spiritual Yelp service to ground the woo and hold space to hold space. Otherwise make sure you like, subscribe, and let me know down below any interesting planetary alignments you have or anything you've learned or anything that you want to share that you know about the planets, I would love to hear it. I'm sending so much love and I will see you in the next one.